So, uh, uh, Jose Hernandez, thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to have the chance to speak to you. And I'm just really grateful that you're going to take time to help us understand Venezuela. Um, as you know, my class has studied Venezuela about a week ago. There are students from a couple of Spanish classes uh, who may, I'm sure, have studied some aspects of Latin America. So, um, I'm going to turn things over to you and then talk for about 10 minutes and ask some questions. So, go for it. Well, Roger, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jose Ignacio Hernandez. I am a law professor back in Venezuela. Currently, I'm a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, working on law and development, and of course, working with my country, Venezuela. I am also working closely with the Venezuelan Congress, the National Assembly, try to restore democracy uh, in Venezuela a country that unfortunately is facing right now an unparalleled complex humanitarian emergency amid a very deep political crisis. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so maybe just talk a little about, um, you know, for those that don't know, the current president is Nicolas Maduro, who succeeded uh, Hugo Chavez. Maybe just take us briefly through that. You know, how did what was uh, Chavez like when he came to power? Why was he elected? And is Nicolas Maduro simply a clone of Chavez, or has he taken the country further? Yeah, how Venezuela collapsed. I'm pretty sure that in the next years we're going to have books, documentaries, movies about the Venezuelan collapse because it's uh, from the macroeconomic perspective, for instance, is very similar to the collapse of some African nations but with a big difference. Just 22, 24 years ago, Venezuela was a wealthy country, one of the wealthy countries in Latin America with a very strong democracy. And in 20 years, Venezuela right now is, as I say, uh, facing a, a crisis only comparable with countries that are facing wars or natural disaster. How Venezuela collapsed? In December, 1998, the Venezuelan people decided to elect an authoritarian and populist leader, Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez was a former military guy that tried to attempt a coup in 1992. He was a very charismatic politician, and he basically explained to the Venezuelan people back in 1998 that Venezuela was suffering a crisis, basically, because the elite, the political elites, the economic elites, we're stealing money from the poor people, something like that. It's, it's, uh, right now, we have a lot of authoritarian populist leaders around the world, but back in 1998, Hugo Chavez was one of the very first ones. And Venezuelan people elected him because the Venezuelan people uh, truly believed that democracy was in crisis and democracy, and democracy was not able to cover the most basic necessities. And they, the Venezuelan people basically elected an authoritarian ruler and was elected in January 1999. Hugo Chavez adopted several authoritarian measures that dismantled the rule of law, that start to destroy the Venezuelan economies with centralized controls over the economy in a very communist way. But then Hugo Chavez uh, has uh, win something you know, like the lottery, because hmm. all prices start to increase. The major boom in the history of Venezuela, which is a petrostate, was precisely between nine and 2002, sorry, and 2012. Uh, it was almost a trillion dollars. I mean, this is a lot of money. I don't know how to say this in English, but it was a, 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 a ton of billion dollars of oil incomes, incomes, and basically with the petrodollars, with all this oil income, Chavez built the image of a very strong and populist leader. And what happened? All prices collapsed, the Venezuelan economy collapsed, and Hugo Chavez died in 2012. Nicolás Maduro, his protégé, was elected in a fraudulent election in April 2013, and Nicolás Maduro decided not to introduce any reform in Venezuela, but to advance with the same authoritarian measures. But authoritarian measures without a charismatic rule, without all incomes, basically leads to a complex 
humanitarian emergency in Venezuela. The GDP, which is basically the national income, has collapsed in Venezuela more than 50%. Just an idea. This is a greater collapse than the, than the Great Depression here in the United States, or for instance, the economic collapse of Spain after the Civil War. Imports of medicine and, and food has collapsed 80%. The local industry has been destroyed due to the expropriation, and as a result of this, people was not able to access to essential goods and services as medicine uh, or food. And this uh, generated, as I say, a complex humanitarian emergency and the biggest migration crisis in the region, and please listen to this, the second biggest migration crisis in the world. Only Syria has more migrants than Venezuela. Syria is 6.5 million, something like that. Venezuela should be something like 5.5 5 million dollars. Uh, dollar, sorry, people. Can I cut in for just a minute, just because a lot of information, I want to make sure this is all being sort of assimilated here. So um, you mentioned that 80% of all imports, or at least medicines and other crucial imports, has ceased in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, the, the GDP, basically the value of the economy, has collapsed by 50%, this being a very wealthy oil state. Clearly some bad decisions were made. Just for a moment, putting aside authoritarian decisions that Nicolas Maduro made, or even Chavez, is it, is it true though? And it, you, know, you also mentioned, by the way, that some billions of dollars, if I understood you correctly, was kind of, has been taken by Chavez and Maduro out of the economy for their own purposes. Is that kind of what you're saying, like a, like a form of corruption? Um, yes, of course. I mean, yes, we should talk, talk in Venezuela about kleptocracy. The estimation of resources deviating from corruption in Venezuela since 1999 and 2016 is about, listen please, $400 billion. $400 billion. And that money is going uh, where? Is, is it going into private bank it's accounts? It's going to, I don't, we, we, we do not know. To, okay. Yeah, bank accounts worldwide. Uh, uh -huh. Because Maduro basically and Chavez used the financial system to deviate Venezuelan resources. So, but just going back to my question. By the way, here in the United States. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Here in the United States, this is why the Department of Justice recently uh, announced an indictment against Nicolás Maduro yeah. due to corruption and drug traffic. It's, it's a mafia state, but with a weak state. I mean, all the all the wrong things that can go uh, with the state, we have them in Venezuela. Uh, obviously, you're describing a very incredibly upsetting uh, situation, but sort of from the macro, meaning we're not talking about individual stories, but obviously people's lives are being profoundly affected by this economic collapse. But just going back to the question, I mean, is it also true that Chavez, partly why he appealed to so many people, is he was addressing inequality in Venezuela? Or is that just propaganda? It was first propaganda and second, again, petrodollars. With hundreds of billions of, billion of dollars in oil income, Hugo Chavez decided to distribute literally dollars in the economy. And this created an illusion that Venezuela was a wealthy country, country and that Maduro was a very good leader because he take care of the poor. But what happened when oil prices collapsed uh, the crisis, no money, no resources, and by the way, a gigantic Venezuelan public debt. The Venezuelan public debt is about $150 billion. Uh, no incomes, a huge debt is basically the perfect storm. So there was, uh, he did distribute money to the poor, but he was using basically the oil wealth of the country. Absolutely. And then, uh, and then so then Nicholas, so he dies, Maduro, his successor not i don't think anyone outside of venezuela really would call that a fair election right yeah. maybe five or six people but um but maduro he you know blocks candidates from running excludes certain political parties people aren't going to jail he, so how has he things have gotten much worse under maduro is that simply because as you mentioned the oil the crash of oil prices meaning oil prices worldwide have gone down or has he actually been worse than Chavez? No, even worse than Chavez. Uh, the big difference is that Chavez was an authoritarian ruler with a state that was working. 
And now Nicolás Maduro, he's an authoritarian ruler without a state because okay. Venezuela is a failed state or a fragile state. And amazingly, this creates obstacles for a democratic transition because basically Maduro is still under control of the very weak institutions in Venezuela. And because of this, it's so hard to implement a political transition when you are dealing with a weak state, with organized crime, dealing with uh, activities that in normal conditions uh, should be adopted directly by the state. Okay. Let me uh, just ask one more question briefly, and then I want to turn things over to students or to uh, Ms. Cortes. Um, what do you see as the prospects for democracy and turning things around in Venezuela? Uh, obviously, you're part of the effort to, to transform it, to bring attention to Venezuela. Uh, you know, what, what keeps you moving forward? We are working on a practical transition that uh, the very first step is a negotiation with Maduro's elite to negotiate a reasonable transition of the very weak institution of the government. There is no other solution, unfortunately. And uh, this is, in my opinion, the binding constraint that we are facing because Maduro does not have any incentive to negotiate because basically he is dealing with a weak state, but however, he still have a lot of money due to oil and other natural resources. But the very first step is a negotiation. Unfortunately, Venezuela has the support, not only of the United States, but also of Latin America and the European Union. And all the countries, more than 60 countries that are supporting the Speaker of the National Assembly, Juan Guaido, as interim president of Venezuela, are supporting a transitional and negotiated process in Venezuela, and this should be the very first step. And then after that, we will face the major task to rebuild Venezuela, which again will be an unparalleled task because it's so hard to find a country with a greater collapse than Venezuela. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to just invite anyone to ask a question. You can either um, unmute yourself, your audio, keep your video muted, just because I'm recording. Um, uh, but go ahead and uh, unmute yourself from audio or just raise your hand, your blue hand, and I'll uh, unmute you. Um, Ms. So you I have a question which, in a way, you answered before, um, but probably if you can extend it yourself a bit more on that, which is what was the situation like when? Um, Chavez was elected, elected by the public, by the, the population of Venezuela. What was the situation like to be able to make a person like him with a nature of a, a, a nature of creating a dictatorship since he tried a coup before um, to convince the population to um, to choose him? Because yes, with populism, is that enough to, if the situation, the general situation in the government and in the society is fine, uh, why to choose for a person who has that kind of dictatorial nature? Well, that's a very good question. And again, uh, Venezuelan people elected in 1998 an authoritarian ruler. And right now, this is unfortunately a very common situation. A lot of people around the world uh, are elected in free elections, authoritarian rulers. Uh, what is happening there? Because it doesn't make any sense that people mm -hmm. decided to vote for an authoritarian ruler. In the Venezuelan case, it was consequence of a deep crisis. Venezuela is a, preto, a petro state, and petro states tend to have a very weak democracy. And this is why Venezuela started facing major political and economic crisis in the 80s. Unfortunately, the politician at that time decided not to implement any reform, but to advance, and this created a major democratic crisis. People start losing faith in democracy and start believing that democracy was responsible for the crisis. And then appeared Chavez that says, said sorry, exactly this. Democracy is not giving food to the people. Only strong leader can give food to the people. And the Venezuelan people that... Uh, uh, have been suffering a major crisis for decades, decided to give a chance to Hugo Chavez, regrettably, because once the people elected an authoritarian ruler, ruler, believe me, is so hard 
to get rid of the authoritarian ruler. Could you, do you want to follow up with that, Marta, at all? Or? No, no, no. Okay. Um, other students, again, just raise your hand or unmute yourself and uh, interrupt me, jump in. I wonder if you could um, broaden that a little bit. I mean, from my classes, we studied about five, six examples of uh, case studies from Latin America across history, going chronologically from Haitian Revolution, Mexican Revolution, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, the coup in Guatemala in 1954. So I'm wondering if you could connect for us what's happening in Venezuela, you know, thinking about sort of as a history class, what are some of the patterns we're seeing playing out um, in Venezuela? Or do you see Venezuela uh, really as a unique case? I mean, one unique aspect is it's post-Cold War, but, you know, are, do, are we seeing the long trajectory of Latin American history playing out here in Latin America, some of which is tragic? A great question. And, and I will say that Venezuela has been a unique case in Latin America for good stuff and for bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, in the in the 60s, for instance, uh, when Latin America was affected by military authoritarian regimes, Venezuela was the exception with a very strong democracy. Mm -hmm. Venezuelan democracy started in 1988 after the deposition of a military dictatorship, uh, Perez Jimenez. And during the 60s, the 70s, when Latin America was facing dictatorship, Venezuela was a very strong democracy. And, and there are wonderful papers uh, written by American professors, for instance, back in the 70s that say that Venezuela was an example of a very successful democratic transition. But regrettably, when Latin America starts to move towards a democratic system after the so-called third way of democratization in the late 70s, beginning 80s, Venezuela starts suffering a democratic decline that in 1998 turned into an authoritarian regime by Hugo Chavez. And right now in Latin America, without any doubt, uh, Venezuela, the country that is facing the worst institutional uh, values, not only in democratic uh, values, but also in rule of law, but also humanitarian uh, values. Even worse than Cuba, for instance, or comparable maybe with Haiti, and Haiti has been a case of a failed state since the last century, something like this. This is, mm -hmm. again, why the Venezuelan is such a tragedy. Just 20 years ago, we were a strong country with strong institutions, and right now we are a country uh, with the lowest GDP in Latin America, even uh, lower than 80s. It's, it's an unbelievable tragedy, to be honest. Could you just add just a little bit more to that about, I mean, the United States for all its you know, problems and so forth, it does have a continuity from you know, every four years we have a election, uh, we got some problems increasingly <laughs> with so on and so forth, but uh, you know, we have a sort of combination toddler authoritarian and in control here. But, you know, why have so many countries in Latin America, you know, struggled to have the continuity to maintain democracy? We know people there embrace democracy. Um, why can't the governments, you know, so frequently um, establish that? A, a great, great, great question. I used to explain in, in, in the Harvard Kennedy School this, this example. Once Latin American countries move into independent nations uh, in the 18th century, they copy the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. For instance, the very first constitution of Venezuela of 1811 is basically the American Constitution. The first constitution in Argentina is basically the United States Constitution. And what happened? I mean, why with the same constitution, the United States was able to build a strong democracy and Latin America has been dealing with such problems. The answer of this question, is, you, uh, you, can, you can understand, sorry, the answer of this question in a wonderful book, uh, Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. And the difference basically is the people. The people in the colonies here uh, were, were educated into the values of liberty. Unfortunately, the uh, people in the Spanish colonies in the current Latin America were educated under totally different values. There was no uh, democratic or republican uh, education back uh, in the Spanish colony. And this is why, unfortunately, the Latin American people decided to be independent without 
uh, democracy, uh, mm -hmm. democratic values. And this can be one of the major explanations of the institutional failure in Latin America in comparison with the institution success of the United States. Again, basically with the same constitution. Okay, so sort of the legacy of colonialism. Uh, Logan, uh, go ahead, you have a question. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, I think you said that Maduro was elected when um, Chavez died, and I was wondering why that was considered an unfair election if it was like a democratic election. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, Ma Maduro was elected in 2013, and then again in 2018. In 2013, uh, he won the presidency by 200 uh, votes, nothing. And there were several irregul irregularities. And the opposition decided to challenge the 2013 election before the Supreme Court in Venezuela. But because Maduro controlled the Supreme Court in Venezuela, the Supreme Court decided not to declare the invalidity of the election and basically declare Nicolas Maduro as president. But in 2018, again, Maduro was elected, but this time in a totally rigged election that was not recognized as such by the international community, basically because Maduro modified the constitutional provisions to conduct a presidential election. Oh, okay, I see. And then my one other question was, you said that um, when Chavez became elected, he like overruled the law kind of, were there certain laws that he took away or put in place that <laughs> seemed especially like bad? Yes, very good question. The very first authoritarian movement, movement of Hugo Chavez was to control the Supreme Court. And he did this in 2004. In 2004, the Venezuelan Supreme Court was uh, controlled by Hugo Chavez. And because of this, the Supreme Court decided to support all the authoritarian uh, measures of Hugo Chavez. And basically, rule of law was dismantled due to the elimination of the check and balancing system. Okay, thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> Any other students want to uh, ask a question about conditions in Venezuela now, about immigration, clarifying questions about the economy or ideas about democracy? Um, again, go ahead and unmute yourself. I'll just stop talking if you do, or I can unmute you if you raise your hand. Um, maybe you could talk a little about, you know, this. Trump administration has been very anti-immigrant, particularly about you know, uh, Latinos crossing the border, um, but has also been critical of Nicolas Maduro. There was, you know, this possible military um, invasion force uh, last week. Not sure where that came from. Maybe you know, but um, yeah, how is this working? I mean, because Venezuelans are coming to the United States. I mean. Are Venezuelans feeling welcome in the United States in a way that, let's say, Hondurans are not? You know, what is, how does that work? It's, it's hard to analyze the United States position toward Venezuela because from one sense, Venezuelan people has been affected by uh, migration decisions of the United States government as any other Latin American people. Uh, but at the same time, the United States government is strongly supporting the democratic transition in Venezuela. So I will say that with the exception of migration measures in which the United States government has not been adopted any favorable treatment toward the Venezuela, the uh, United States government is one of the biggest supporters of the democratic transition in Venezuela. But for, for immigrants coming, are they... What kind of stories do you hear from immigrants who are coming to the United States? From well, uh, the, the issue is that there is not a big number of Venezuelan migrants here in the United States. The migration crisis right now in Venezuela is affecting Colombia, Brazil, Peru, but not here in the United States. So the problems of the Venezuelan people here in the United States as migrants are the regularly an ordinary problem. There is a, anything of, of particularity there. And how are Venezuelans doing in, in neighboring countries like Brazil? Are they being welcomed? Are they struggling to find work? Yeah, it's, it's a very pity, very pity because there are been problems with xenophobic attitudes against Venezuelan people. But taking aside this regrettable situation, 
I will say that all the Latin American governments, including, for instance, Brazil, that tends to have a migration policy similar to the policy of the United States, all the Latin American countries have been adopted several measures that favor uh, and protect the Venezuelan migrants. Okay. Um, it, it's interesting what you are saying because, um, well, not that the governments have been accepting migration, but reports that I've been hearing, even in American media, talk about uh, the resistance and the rejection and increased racism that Venezuelans are receiving in all these neighbor countries. Um, yeah, in, in Peru, for instance. Uh, there even, even, been even Argentina, I heard. Argentina, yeah. Uh, Peru, is a, we have a major problem of racism against Venezuela there. Yeah. yeah. And but this is not an issue, sorry, of the government. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. and, and I, at some extent, I, I, at some point, I understand the situation. We are not talking about two or three Venezuelan people. Yeah. We are talking about yeah. a massive. Massive. Yeah, so, so uh, it, it's, it's a very complex situation. And it's very saddening because um, Venezuela has been a country very receptive to other nations, yes. immigrants for many decades uh, until their situation was extreme. So it's kind of reversal. It's, it makes me think of Spain and their back and forth um, resistance with immigrants, but when we were also an immigrant country one time. Yeah, this is, I mean, this, this will change Venezuela forever. As you said, Venezuela received immigrants from Europe, for instance, uh, and right now, uh, the diaspora in Venezuela is about, I say, five million people. It, it's a lot of 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 of, of people. Uh, Fifteen, maybe twenty percent of Venezuelan people are living abroad. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you compare other similar cases, Albania, Greece, uh, experience demonstrate that sixty percent of the diaspora never returned to Venezuela. So yeah. even if we were able, and we are going to rebuild Venezuela without any doubt. Regrettably, half of those people, three million or so of Venezuela, will decide to live abroad. And this will create a new problem for Venezuela because this will be the very first time that the Venezuelan will be living part in Venezuela, part uh, abroad, as is maybe a regular condition or a common condition in other countries, again, Albania. But for Venezuela, this will be a major sociological change. Mm -hmm. uh, do those people tend to be better educated, uh, more at least at one point, more middle and upper class, or is it across the? No, no. Uh, maybe there have been several waves of, of migrations in Venezuela. The first okay. one uh, at the beginning of this century, I will say, until the last five years, were basically the most educated people. Mm -hmm. uh, but since the last five years, everybody's living in Venezuela, mm -hmm. uh, uh, even people without education that decided to leave Venezuela uh, just to try to find a way of living. So we're at a half hour um, and I said, uh, I promise you, I just want to really, it's an honor to talk to you uh, and to meet no, you. No, my pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you. And, you know, just uh, thank you for your, your, your struggle uh, to bring democracy back to uh, the hemisphere. <laughs> it's badly needed. Um, and um, you know, uh, I'll I'll follow up with you online to say thanks again. But just really appreciate the time you took. Thank you so much for the. Thank invitation. you, thank you so much. Uh, in you. an ideal world, I would have brought you to my classes. <laughs> but yeah. at least it's wonderful to have been able to meet you here. And I hope that other opportunities will come in the future. Yeah, Marta, I'm gonna. Um, I recorded this and I'll post it uh, at some point soon. I'll send you the link so you can show it to your students if you want. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.